started to take down notes for today for narrative nonfiction, and the longer I thought about it, the more confused I got. Like what you just said, is it just a label for booksellers or what agents need or what we need? And um, the term narrative nonfiction is confusing. I think it's really difficult to grasp. Therefore, I would like to start with a definition, a very basic one. There's one clear distinction between fiction and non-fiction. Fiction can be based on facts, but it doesn't have to be. And non-fiction must only be based on facts. Well, as I said, it's very basic, but that already gets difficult. Does pure non-fiction really exist, and what does pure mean? And um, as we heard before, the distinction between fiction and non-fiction is blurred. The historian Hayden White went even further. He has argued in his book, Meta History, that historical writing mirrors literary writing in many ways. So to say, fictional elements are unavoidable, meaning many techniques of composition and storytelling apply to both. So I think we are therefore talking about narrative techniques rather than fictional elements, and that's a very important distinction. An author of non-fiction book who is willing to open up his field and touch a wider audience has to work with these techniques. It starts with the story, the sushi. The author, no, the story the author decides <coughs> uh, he wants to tell will always be arbitrary. He or she will mention some facts and leave out others. He will have access only to a certain number of documents and sources, and he will highlight some characters and neglect others. He needs to tell a story to engage with the reader. It means he must choose a beginning and an ending for the example that he has to rely on storytelling, not forget a good plot. And in some cases, book, in some books, um, the author even becomes part of this sujet too, like Bruce Chapman and Songlines, for example. In this way, all non-fiction writing is in some way fictional, because it's impossible, for example, to reach a historical truth, or that would be interesting to discuss if something like historical truth does exist, and to show how things actually were to quote the German historian Leopold von Ranke, who said, like, wie es eigentlich gewesen ist. I think it's really impossible to read this. I think fictional elements are avoidable. Good storytelling is essential. And starting with the first myth of creation, we need <coughs> stories to explain the world we live in. And this is exactly what good nonfiction should do, too. And I think it's now more expected for nonfiction books to be narrative. We probably all know are now very common praise, like, you know it's non-fiction, but it reads like fiction. Or for example, we published George Packer as well, and um, it became a bestseller after we got this huge review saying the big American novel of this year is a non-fiction book. So that's <laughs> how it started. The way these narrative techniques are being applied are influenced by various aspects. I would like to mention three of them. First, fashion and influences. Second, cultural differences. And last, the historical distance. So the first fashion and influences, my example there would be the German science writer Stefan Klein. He was a kind of pioneer in science writing or German science writing, and he wrote various bestsellers. You probably all know the science of happiness that was translated to 27 languages. Klein is influenced by American and English science writers like the evolutionary biologist and science popularizer John Haldane. He has learned from him that the ideas can take over the role of a protagonist, to mention one technique, or another one that the reader can become the hero who discovers by himself how science or the laws of nature influence his daily life. That the reader gets involved in the topic sometimes together with the author. For example, in his latest books on dreams, um, it's a book about what we know or what neuroscience knows about dreams and how the brain works. Um, Klein talks about his own dreams a lot. That's, of course, very fictional. But um, it's very clear, but it's also mixed with the latest research to understand what's beneath them. But of course, it's always clear what are the facts and what are the interpretation or the explanation. His books have a certain dramaturgy, are packed with facts. They are pure non-fiction as far as possible. This is very rare and uncommon in Germany. Therefore, he's one of the few authors who became a kind of brand. And it's rare because of the second point I would like to mention, the cultural differences. In Germany, non-fiction writing um, used to be mostly academic. 
It's not, for example, like at the United States where you, the human touch and the personalization is much more important. And in some ways it's still the case that German nonfiction writing tends to be very academic. The more narrative nonfiction is, especially historical nonfiction, the more suspicious the reader is that the author is not truthful, that his work does not fulfill the scientific standards. This has several reasons. First is the academic tradition that most historians are busy till the mid-40s to, the, to fulfill the academic demands within the university and the demands of their colleagues. And another reason are the media, the reviewers. So many non-fiction books are reviewed by experts in the field, and that's not always very helpful. And the readers, they long for clear labels. It has to be the book by the expert on that topic. So selling books by journalists on a certain topic becomes more and more difficult. And I think the perfect book, um, the ideal one would be a scientist who writes himself on his research, skillfully applying narrative techniques. It's a kind of non-fiction editor's dream. Um, and the third point, the last point, would be the historical distance. There are certain topics which need, which need a certain time until they can be fictionalized. And it would be interesting to see later if this is true in all other countries, or rather what the specific topics are. In Germany, one of these topics would be National Socialism and books on the Holocaust. It's still a very sensitive topic to mix with strong narrative, like moods or emotions, or writing on subjects that are connected or occupied by National Socialism, like euthanasia. The term alone would be impossible to use in the current discussion, or it's not at all neutral. And also really has to stay clearly within the borders of fact-based non-fiction. So probably fictionalization of a certain topic can be an indicator how sensitive a society is to a subject, of how much a society comports himself to a certain topic. And it can be vice versa. New ways of storytelling and a diversity of forms like movies, graphic novels, etc. can initiate a new way of debating a certain topic or confronting the past. To reach a broader audience, fiction probably works better. It's so much more direct and easier to identify this. And to stay with the um, sensitive subject of National Socialism, um, I found really interesting that the TV series Holocaust really sparked a big discussion in the within the German society of the Shoah, not a book, and also um, initiated a, a debate if it's adequate to deal with a topic like this. Incorporating techniques absolutely enriches nonfiction, and the readers seem to accept or even long for it. There's a change. Um, so good, the good news is, in the end, the readers will decide which course nonfiction will take. Whenever a new nonfiction book is published in a new format or new literary style and has become hugely, hugely successful, I mean, that's of course written, <coughs> it opens up new possibilities for other books, whether it's the format or the topic. Like Deva Sobel many years ago, of Florian Illis now, is his book on the year 1913. It's a book full of facts and quotes, but put, to, put together in a wonderful, very narrative way. So it, this one really reads like a novel. Um, and this shows one successful book can change everything.